Hi, uh, my name is Amy Jacob. I am an allergist and a clinical immunologist at Children's of Alabama here in Birmingham. Um, I'm really honored and excited to be giving this lecture today um, for ACHIA, Breathe Alabama, the collaborative. I'm going to be talking about making the connection and establishing the link between allergies and asthma. Uh, for proper long-term management of asthma, uh, primary aim is to identify and reduce relevant allergens and irritants that exacerbate the asthmatic airway. There are specific aims that the EPR3 national guidelines uh, for management of asthma have identified, and this is uh, an important one. It's recommended that you do this said asthma of any level of severity. More attention tends to be given to the indoor inhalant allergens, but we'll see that the outdoor are important as well. And a lot of asthmatics will report that their, the, their symptoms tend to flare seasonally with, with the pollen. So when an asthmatic is exposed to inhalant allergens that they're sensitized to, it increases airway inflammation and symptoms. This is all important, and, and again, we're establishing the link because if you can figure out what a patient is allergic to and give them some tips and tricks on how to avoid those specific allergens in their environment, you can reduce medication use, asthma symptoms, and overall just improve their day-to-day -day quality of life. So first we'll, we'll start our overview of the allergens uh, with the outdoor allergens, the pollens. Uh, when we're talking about the pollens, we're talking about the tree, grass, and weed pollens. Uh, the timing of the different pollens can vary regionally. In Alabama, tree, tends, tree pollen season tends to start pretty early, um, as, as early as maybe late January to mid-February, and goes through April. The grass pollen season is typically in May and June. The weed pollen season tends to be from probably early to mid-August to mid-October. The clinical history, just what you hear when you're talking to a patient, is often sufficient to diagnose seasonal allergic rhinitis. Patients will report a runny, drippy nose uh, during these certain times, uh, clear drainage, they can get red, itchy eyes. A lot of these symptoms can be worse with different exposures like cutting grass. Patients will report that their eyes will be itching and kind of go crazy when they're cutting grass. Along with that, their symptoms tend to be relieved with antihistamines. Now we're going to be talking about the indoor or the perennial allergens. Those include cat and dog danders, dust mite, cockroach, and the molds. Oftentimes, clinical history, what you hear a patient report, is not sufficient to be able to diagnose and tease through exactly which of these allergens that they're truly having a problem with. It's recommended that you that you perform some kind of allergy evaluation, whether by skin prick testing or in vitro testing. For the danders, cat and dog, it's a combination, for the cat, it's a combination of their saliva, urine, and dander. Those are the dried flakes of skin that people tend to be allergic to. For a dog, it's the dander itself. Dust mites are microscopic animals that we cannot see with the naked eye, but they're present in all of our mattresses, pillows, carpets, curtains, couches, stuffed animals, anything plush. Uh, they're present year round, but people tend to be bothered by them more in the fall and winter when it's cold outside. And patients are gonna be spending more time indoors because of the cold weather. And so they're just gonna be exposed to dust mite more when indoors. Cockroach can be tough to avoid living in Alabama. Uh, but it, again, tends to be worse in the fall, winter, when not only are we staying indoors, but cockroaches are scurrying into homes trying to escape the cold. Uh, in various studies, cockroaches have been identified as the number one risk factor for the development of inner city asthma. Molds tend to be present year round, uh, but flare during the fall time. Alternaria is uh, a classic example with asthma. It's the most common outdoor mold and again has been linked strongly to, uh, to flares of asthma in various studies. There are a whole host of other factors, things that are not true IgE mediated allergens, but they're very important nevertheless to asthma flares and severity. 
Um, but probably most notable is tobacco, and whether that's primary or secondary exposure can certainly worsen asthma severity. Diesel exhaust fumes, more of a problem as you can imagine in, in larger cities and how and your proximity to those cities. Uh, but that can be another irritant factor that can flare asthma. Volatile organic compounds or VOCs and occupational exposures, and that tends to get overlooked. You can be exposed to various occupational exposures. Uh, some are simply uh, directly irritating and noxious to the airways. Some actually can elicit an IgE response. Uh, again, they're often overlooked and the diagnosis of occupational related asthma can be delayed by typically years. Uh, but it's been shown to cause up to about 25% of adult onset asthma. So don't forget to take an employment history uh, and that employment history does have to extend back uh, even possibly decades. It can be a an, uh, an, an very remote uh, trigger. So now that we've learned about what factors are involved, we need to know how to diagnose them. So first we'll talk about skin prick testing, but in general you can evaluate, evaluate allergies by either one of two methods, the skin prick testing or in vitro or blood allergy testing. In regards to skin prick testing, there's no age limit. Results are available quickly within 20 minutes, which patients uh, very much appreciate. It is less expensive than in vitro testing, uh, and when comparing the two, is equally as sensitive, but is more specific. This is more relevant in a patient with other atopic disease, such as eczema. I'm going to feel much more confident about the results and the specificity that's obtained through skin prick testing rather than in vitro testing. The downside here is that there's a small risk of systemic reaction. If a patient is so severely allergic, to the environmental allergens, say cat or dog, pollens, dust mite, even just the small skin prick scratches on the back can, can give a patient a reaction up to and including anaphylaxis. It's very rare, but it can happen. In vitro testing uh, has changed names throughout the years. It used to be referred to as RAST testing, and then was CAP-RAST testing, and is now ImmunoCAP. These assays are uh, sandwich ELISAs. Um, but when you get the results, you'll see a couple different numerical values that we'll talk about. The advantages to in vitro or blood allergy testing is that the results are not affected by antihistamine use. For skin, skin prick testing that I perform in my office, patients have to be off of the newer generation of antihistamines, whether that's Zyrtec, Claritin, Allegra, Zizol, they need to be off of those medications for five to seven days prior to testing. The older generation, Benadryl hydroxyzine, only needs to be stopped for about 48 hours prior to testing. In vitro testing has wider availability. If, if you don't have an allergist that can perform skin prick testing within a reasonable distance, all you need is a, a lab that has the in vitro testing available. Additionally, there are seemingly endless possibilities for in vitro testing. I am limited with skin prick testing to the extracts that I have available in my office. But if a patient is concerned about a seemingly uh, rare allergen, there's likely to be an in vitro test available to that. The disadvantages are, again, that it's less specific. I feel more confident in general about how clinically relevant the sensitizations are with skin prick testing. In vitro testing, additionally, you're, it's a longer time to results. It's about one to two weeks typically until patients get results. If you're one of my patients at the VA, that can be at least four to six weeks. So when you do get the results, again, you'll see two different numerical values. The first to the report is the quantity of the measurable IgE to that specific allergen. For example, for cat, it's cat-specific IgE. Negative on all the in vitro testing values is less than 0 0.1. Then what they'll do is they'll put these values into ranges, what they call classes, and connect a class to help primary care physicians determine the severity. There's no, there are no true cutoffs here. The classes that are created, they're not evidence-based, but again, offers kind of a rough guide for the clinician to be able to you know, understand and what to tell the patient. 
For example, a class three is likely to be more clinically significant than a class one, but you have to be careful with the interpretation of in vitro testing. Again, with a negative cutoff at less than 0.1, for example, a 0.18 specific IgE will be reported as a class one positive, but is it likely to be clinically significant? No, I would still consider that negative. If in vitro testing is run, I always do recommend obtaining a total IgE level as well. This can help give you some context for the other values. For example, if a patient's cat-specific IgE is reported back as 22, which is a class four value that they report as very high. But if a patient's total IgE is 1,800, 22 out of 1,800 may not be very significant for that patient. However, if your total IgE is 35, well then a cat-specific IgE of 22 out of 35 is likely to be a much bigger problem for that patient. So when we get down to it, what do these allergens that we now know how to detect really do to the airway? When an asthmatic is exposed to the inhalant allergens, that they're sensitized to, it increases airway inflammation and symptoms, as, as we've said. So that, it, again, if you can identify by, by either skin prick testing or in vitro testing what the patient's allergic to, you educate on environmental avoidance. Controlling those sensitizations and those allergens can lead to less airway inflammation, symptoms, medication use. And will, and will improve the patient's day-to-day -day quality of life, as well as objectively their ACT scores when they're in your office. Because of this, the EPR3 guidelines recommends that the physician or the provider consider allergen immunotherapy, those are allergy shots, at any level of asthma severity. We start shots when kids are about typically five years of age for environmental allergens. Allergen immunotherapy has been the only factor proven time and again in studies to prevent the development of asthma. If I'm caring for a child that is on the atopic march, then this is something I'm going to consider. When we talk about the atopic or the allergic march, that, that's typically a kid that is about two, three months old and develops eczema. And then when they're about six months old, you can identify some food allergy when they start to feed them more solid foods. Allergic rhinitis that they can detect by skin prick testing or in vitro testing, typically around 18 months. And then the last step in this quote unquote march is asthma. And so that, this is the patient where I try to intervene, where I'm gonna consider allergen immunotherapy sooner rather than later. As far as the natural history, uh, the age desensitization for the environmental allergens, for the perennial allergens, it takes about a year to become allergic to the perennial allergens. These are things that children are exposed to day to day. Things that they, whether it's a cat or a dog that they're around in their home, or the dust mite that they're, uh, that they're exposed to uh, year round. As far as the seasonal allergens, it does take longer to develop, quote unquote, an allergy or a sensitization to the environmental allergens. Again, for an 18 month old, they've only ever seen two fall seasons or it's their second spring season that they're seeing. You cannot be allergic to something the first time your immune system encounters it. You need to have been exposed to it before in order to become sensitized. So again, under 18 months, it can happen, but it's difficult to be pollen allergic at that age. Again, we discussed that there's no age limit but for the skin prick testing or in vitro testing on either extreme end. Uh, and in general, the natural history of allergies is that environmental allergens and the severity of them tend to decline with time. Thank you.